our guest tonight, Akeem Pierre. Akeem and I have a long history, and we were just kind of chatting, uh, getting back into all the history that we have together in the basketball world. We played high school basketball against each other. We played provincial team together, and then we played a UBC for a year together. Yes. Fuck, there's a lot of stories that we could <laughs> chat about. So The first stories. thing that comes to mind, though, is <laughs> Del Komarniski and the heat outs. <laughs> <laughs> Just wild, man. When I think back to those times. Man. Like, Can you imagine if he to... did that now? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> like, we're about to go to a game. <laughs> you know, we're already in, like, probably Vegas. Like, you know, like, in some hot, hot place. You know, like we need to be hydrated. We need to be in like top physical performance. <laughs> and he's just like having such a good time. You know what I mean? It was so funny. Can you d- explain to people what a heat out is? A heat out where we'd be in a van, like just a bunch of young men in a van. <laughs> and he would close the windows, like close the doors. We're not allowed to open the windows and just turn the heat all the way up. <laughs> and, and we would just be in there sweating like... It was a sauna. You know, saunas are popular nowadays. And we were creating that back in the day, like in the van, like every opportunity <laughs> we were making saunas. And like you said, he even did it in Vegas. So we were in Vegas in the middle of or end of July. Yeah. It's like 44, 45 degrees outside. And we're leaving an air conditioned gym, going back to the hotel. And the, we have these heat outs and it's like half an hour going back to the hotel. It's 48 degrees inside the car. It's 48 <laughs> degrees outside the car. <laughs> People are just we're rubbing sweating. elbows and shoulders. Oh. Like we're like they're like six, 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 eight people in this <laughs> van. Like it's like what? I don't know if you're in the car because we usually have too many vans. But there was one time that Rob was so mad mm-hmm. that he just took all his clothes off <laughs> in the van and just threw them at Dell. He's like, no, "This is just no. shit. What are we doing here? How is I this legal?" That was too. That was too funny though. I'm excited to reconnect, man. Yes. You have a lot going on in your life right now, don't you? Yes, 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 I do. I'm excited to dig a little deeper into it because I'm watching from afar Mm -hmm. on your Instagram and tuned into a little bit of the YouTube channel, but obviously want to get into that. Yeah. I just want to, before I let you explain and describe yourself, I want to talk to people because it's, it's difficult to, maybe they'll understand from this hour, hour and a half conversation that we have. But you are one of the most optimistic, enthusiastic, positive people I've ever met. And so that's part of, part of the reason why I wanted to have you on. But I also want to just chat about like what, what you got going on. Uh, where does this positive energy come from? Because it, it was mm. like, I knew this when we played basketball together. Yeah. You were always like the happiest dude on the team. Yeah. <laughs> and you can like, you can totally see it. Anytime you're around mm-hmm. you, it's like, it's hard not to smile. Yeah. Were you always a happy, like, were you just like a super happy, positive kid growing up too? You know, I, I was pretty happy, pretty positive. But what I could say is like, this was like a mindset that I developed as a young, as a, as a child, just because like growing up with my brother, it was like, I either go crazy or I like learn to love it. You know what I mean? I either... Like growing up in my household, these are like I would go crazy or I would learn to, to enjoy things, you know? So as a child, I remember I used to be scared to dance. And my family used to make fun of me. I remember it was Shaggy. And we, we, we <laughs> missed the law of a law ball. <laughs> you know, Mr. Boom Bostick. Like I mastered his voice because it's like, you know, like he played it so many times. But it was like I would cry. And what I did, what I chose to do behind the doors was I would practice dancing. You know what I mean? And I would like enjoy myself dancing. So then what I, what I was like, I didn't want to feel that way. So then I don't know, like, I'm like, I'm learning from myself as a child now, you know, but as I was, I didn't want to feel that way when I was dancing. So I'm like, when no one's around, I'm going to practice. So then I can come and I can feel good and I can join in and I can be happy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I kind of, you know, like these little things, I don't know how I was such a wise kid. Like it was so, it was so interesting, but yeah, it was, it was with me for a long time, let's say. For a long, long time. Move this a little closer. Yeah. What, what age did you decide to do that? Because I, I had a very similar experience in that I was a little bit of a shy kid mm-hmm. in like elementary school. And I would do that shit too. I'm sure a lot of people out there would do that. But yeah. just like being too embarrassed to dance in front of people. I didn't even go to a lot of high school dances. Yeah. But in like my bedroom, 
I would just put some headphones on and some yes. tunes and just go for it. Right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Watch in front of a mirror and just be like, "Ooh, I shouldn't be doing that." You know, like, <laughs> that looked really bad. You know what I mean? <laughs> just preparing. I was probably like six, seven years old, really. So I was like young, young, young. Like this is some of my earliest memories that I have in my life. Was those memories? What I. <laughs> I'm trying to think of like where it comes from. So did you have like any influences? Was it parents? Was yeah. it that brought out this optimism? Yeah. My mom is, yeah. she herself, she's so optimistic. And like, it would be like, as a basketball player, it would bother me how optimistic she was. <laughs> She'd be like, it's okay. No, like, oh, you played so well. Like she would always be telling me all this stuff to make me feel good. And like always offer that positive perspective. And she would never really allow me to see her being negative. And that really, that really rubbed off on me. And I got to see that. And um, yeah, even though it pissed me off, I'm like, yo, mom, like, can I be like, I played horrible, you know, but she wouldn't allow me to, to sit into that. And then, you know, as I look back, I'm like, yeah, that was really impactful on my life. And she's still like that to this day. So, you know, my mom, like, that's why I'm a mama's boy at the end of the day. Like, <laughs> you know, I have so much love, give so much thanks for, for her and, you know, all that she taught me. Do you think that, so you think that's a learned thing? It's not a genetic thing? Just the optimism? Mm. What I'm trying to get at is like, obviously you run into people who are just miserable about everything, who no matter what happens, they think the world is against them type of thing. And for me, that's like one of the biggest turnoffs in terms of like who I surround myself with, yeah. whether it's like friends, some family, <laughs> <laughs> but just like, I can't even stand to be around people that are just always complaining. Yeah. So do you think it's something that's learned or do you, do you think it's like an, uh, so what I'm getting at is like nature versus nurture. Mm -hmm. Is it something you're born with that you're just like a happy kid and you just like keep growing that way? Or is it like a conscious switch? That's a good question. I feel like it's definitely a balance of both. Like, I feel like we have an opportunity to either go more into our positivity or into these traits that we were born with, or maybe we get drawn away from it and then we like re rebel against those traits. So I happen to, you know, have this disposition, this positive disposition, coupled with my mother, coupled with a competitive family and a brother who like, I couldn't win, you know, it's not like I, I couldn't win. So I had to learn, you know, and I couldn't, I couldn't win for one. And I couldn't be like bitter or sour or angry because that would just give him more fuel. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I feel like it's, it's definitely part of like just the, the nature, but also the nurture. Like I'm really big on like the environment and how that has a role into it. And just as I look back, I think about how I want to raise my child. And I feel like I have the ability the, to, to affect and influence my child a little bit in that sense, because, you know, <laughs> we can go a little bit into this, but up until seven years old, the child is like in a hypnotic state and they're just learning and absorbing everything from what they see, right? And I was around my mother up until seven, like my father wasn't in the house, right? So I was with my mother up until that time. So I feel like if we just look into that, like up until seven, you're in this hypnotic theta brainwave state, then that's going to kind of build up the base of the child, right? So we don't really take that time that important. But I look back and I'm like, when I have my children, I'm going to really, you know, do as best as I can to be that positive embodiment influence in the life in that time, because they're watching everything, whether we feel they are, or we know they are or not. So you're almost saying like, you didn't think there was another way kind of thing because your mom was so optimistic all the time with you and positive with you. Yeah. Do you understand now how rare that is though? Yeah, big time. Because when you get into the real world and you're surrounded by people of all different upbringings, it's rare. Yeah. It's not common that you see people that are always enthusiastic and excited about what they're doing. Yeah. And I had to make, I like made this choice consciously of like, did I want to be like my mother? Or did I want to be like my brother? <laughs> Not saying he's a bad guy or anything, but he was just like that aggressive force in my life. And that, that you know, more of like on that side. And I was like, no, I don't want to, you know? <laughs> I just the younger brother, I was like, no, 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 I don't want to be like that. I don't want to, you know? I'm just a younger brother, you know? <laughs> he had that big effect on me, but 
you know, I was like, I had to, I was like, I mean, be more like that, you know? So yeah, I definitely, it was a How much rare, older is he? He's four years older. Do you chat with him lots though? Yeah. Yeah, we do talk. Does he live in Vancouver? He lives in Calgary. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Why, oh, I guess, why did you guys butt heads so much growing up? I don't know, but it's not like we butted heads. It was just like how we it was were. just competitive? Yeah, it was yeah. just competitive. Like he would always just like bully me, beat me, you know? <laughs> and it was never like, I never thought it was like malicious. Yeah. I never thought he hated me or anything. It was never like that, but it was just like. Oh, <laughs> he's so much bigger. Like, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> my older brother, who's nine years older than me, is like, he's my best friend still today. Yeah. But growing up, he was nine years older than me. So I was always a little kid. Mm-hmm. And so he was like in high school and in university when we started playing one on one together. Yeah. Outside. <laughs> and I guess I grew pretty early. And he's not that tall. He's maybe 5'10 or 5'11. Mm-hmm. And so I grew early in like grade seven or eight. Yeah. And I was six one, six two, and so I was lanky and like awkward. But I started beating him at one on one in grade eight or nine. Wow! And he got he like most of our one on one events, and this would happen almost every night. Yeah, would be us ending in a fight, like fist fights. Yeah. And so I remember <laughs> this one night where we came inside. I just beat him, Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, we, we never played one on one again after this day because I beat him, and we come inside like just yelling and swearing at each other. And yeah. my dad's like, that's it. You're never playing again. <laughs> but I think it was just Vinny knowing that he couldn't beat me anymore. So he didn't want to play me again. Yeah. But I had the same thing. It's just that it was like so competitive all the time with yeah. him. Yeah. But now obviously we don't, we aren't really competitive anymore, but he's like, it grew into this like really good friendship too. Yeah. So like we have that bond, like a similar bond. I imagine where it's like, we knew it was always love. It was no matter what yeah. it was always love. So now you're just like, yo, we've been through so much together, <laughs> like all those times, like so much together. And it's like, I feel really grateful to have that in my life because he was like a big thing of me developing toughness. You know what I mean? So like on one side, like you see me smiling, like, oh, so happy. And on the other side, you don't want to be like against me. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? so like I, I'm grateful for that a lot and what he taught me on that side. I remember in provincial team practices, you were always one guy that no one wanted to guard <laughs> because no matter what, <laughs> it could be like the first practice of the year and we're just like in warm up. Akeem is going 100% oh every single play on defense, on offense. He's never taken a playoff. <laughs> so you were like that guy that no one wanted to guard. And I wasn't that skilled. <laughs> but you just worked hard. So like I was just working hard and. I would be like going for rebounds, like offensive board. Yeah. Like. <laughs> you were the reason that we had to run so much because yeah. Dell would make us run every time we gave up an offensive rebound or every time someone took a charge. <laughs> it was so funny. I'm there like taking charges, like so happy. <laughs> yeah, it was funny time. Do you ever have off days? Big time. I have like off months and years. You know what I mean? Big time. Do you know what causes them? What causes them for me? Um, for me, I have a big doubt. I have so much doubt in my mind. So like, I, like, I, I know like kind of like my baseline programming is don't do it. You can't do it. You're, you don't need to do it. You're, you're lazy. You're slick. You know what I mean? Like, don't try. Why you got to try? You're good where you are. That's my baseline. You know what I mean? So when I let that take over, when I, you know, let routine slip, when I, you know, forget about these basics, yeah. that takes over. And then I go into these, these bad days. Mm. Yeah. Where does that baseline come from? Oh, right. Because if you, before you said you were, you consciously made a decision to be, go the mom optimistic yes, route. Yes, yes. So... I, I guess just like, where, how does that come? Where does that come from? Right. That's a, that's a great question. Or have you thought about that? Um, of where it came from? Kind of. Um, so like when I have my mom telling me, like, first off, playing basketball, I was hardest on myself, like the hardest. Mm-hmm. I was never good enough. I was never, you know, I was never, um, yeah, never good enough. And throughout all that, with my positivity, it wasn't as if things were perfect. I was just knowing like, 
hey, even if I have this doubt, even when I have these bad days, these bad years, these bad months, and I have the doubt, I'm able to look at it from more of that positive perspective still. So when I look at it as like, like there was a times when I'd be like, yeah, I'm, I'm depressed right now. And I could look at myself and be like, yeah, this is what is depression, right? And because depression, like being below, like depressed, like being lower, right? And I was like, this would be depression, but I just have the more of the positive way to look at it. So I'm walking around smiling. I'm walking around happy and I'm not allowing my energy to project onto others Mm -hmm. and, you know, doing my best to, you know, keep that. But, you know, I have these days and I, you know, I just, I, you know, I do my best to keep it into perspective and to know of like, you know, this, this, this is, this is what I'm working with and I have the tools to elevate above it. And it's up to me of like, do I want to utilize these tools? You know, so, yeah. Do you, I know the outside is always like super excited and happy. Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel like you're covering up a depressive day or depressive week or whatever? Um, hmm. You know, not really. No? Okay. Because where I'm kind of going with it is, one, like, how do you get out of these depressive times? Because yeah. everyone goes through them. Mm-hmm. And I've gone through a bunch recently. Yeah. So, like, one, what gets you out of them? And I'm mm-hmm. sure it's different tools for every person, but I think there's a lot to learn from sharing what works for you. Yeah. But at, at times, I've noticed myself feeling like I've almost, like, put on this face. Yeah. Of, like, no, I need to be happy. This is who I am kind of thing. Yeah. Rather than, like, trying to understand the actual emotions that you're feeling. Mm -hmm. So how I would say it is I would put on a face for others, but not myself, you know? So I would just not want to like, even just who I am, I wouldn't want to have certain people. I know they kind of rely on me. They kind of, you know, they really, you know, whatever I'm going through, this is how I feel like whatever I'm going through, I feel like, I could deal with it and I could work through it and I don't need to put that on others. Yeah. You know, so I'm really mindful of who I share this with. I'm really mindful of who I, you know, express. And when I was going through those times, I kept people around me where I didn't have to put on a face. You know what I mean? hundred percent. Yeah. So I just was like, I switched my environment. So like, Hey, I could be like, I could be like, even with other more like in their depressed state kind of people. And we could, we could talk about it and we could, you know, work on like, like what we're going through together. And, you know, sometimes like I talk to these, these friends now and it's like, yeah, we were in a dark place together. You know, we spent months in this dark place together where I'd only hang out with like two, three people, you know, but um, yeah, I would, I would, you know, what was for the most part, like I have a hard time lying to myself. And I would face it to myself and I would just kind of hide away or like not present myself more yeah. than anything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a cool point is that you can, you can always appear something different on the surface, but mm. you really know deep down what you're personally going through. Yeah. So like Instagram is obviously a good way to like sh- f- put on a facade. Right? Yes. Yes. Whereas like a lot of people that are, portraying this super happy image on Instagram are really struggling Mm -hmm. internally, right? Yeah. Yes. So that's a, that's a very important thing that I think about a lot is like, should I share this more on Instagram? Right. And it's something that I do want to do more of. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just learning first, like how to express myself, right. In a way where it's not like taking me, like taking a pity or, you know, making me like a call out. I just, you know, I just want to share this. For me, I have a harder time of that kind of expression because it's new to me, right? That's the one side. And then the other side is I want to look at Instagram as more of a vision board of like, you know, people say like, this is your highlights. Well, this is my vision board. I put what I want to see. You know, I put what I want to see out there. So when people see my Instagram and they reflect that back at me, oh, thank you for reminding me. You know what I mean? This is a vision board that's out there for everyone to see. So at the same time, I don't want to be putting too much of the what's going on behind the scenes or what I don't want to see manifest more of. But I do want to put a little bit more of that. 
you know, I do want to share that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. I'm in the same boat and I'm trying to find the right balance, I think, in terms of one, like you, how to express it. Because I think you're right that if you put that stuff out there more, people are going to bring it up more often with you. Mm -hmm. That's uh, Carl, that is a super good point he just made. Vision board rather than like, this is what is today kind of thing. Yeah. That's super good. We had the choice. It's right? hard to explain, mm -hmm. but it makes sense in my head. Yeah, like there's a vlogger, Casey Neistat, right? And he puts these daily vlogs out. He would put these daily vlogs out and they wouldn't be his day. He wouldn't be like, hey, I woke up today. Hey, I ate this. Hey, I did this. He would choose to tell a story each day, right? So that's what we have the ability to do. You could tell whatever story it is that you want to do. You don't have to be like, oh, this is my diary, Instagram. It doesn't have to be that. You choose what you want to make it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I, you know, decided to take that route more. Mm -hmm. It's <clears throat> interesting to think back in the posts that I've gotten the best feedback or just like the most feedback on from people are the ones that are the most vulnerable, vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm, big time. <laughs> it's not the ones being like, look at me, I just sold a house or, you know, no one yeah. gives a shit about that. Yeah. It's like actually being a real human being mm -hmm. that has struggles and sharing a story and how you got through it or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So how do you get through them? How do you get through those downtimes? Those downtimes? You mentioned like communicating with people and just like sharing your experience with someone else that's maybe going through a tough time? Yeah. Um, so my, it's like a expansive toolkit that I've collected over the years. And one thing is just, you know, putting on music that makes you feel good. Right. So there's just like s those simple ways of like, you know, you could put on music that makes you feel good. And then you instantly get put into this state of like, you're dancing, you're having fun. Right. Um, another one is just going outside. So what happened was when I was in like my, what I would say is like my most down, kind of like saddest times of my life, I was doing workouts, but I was only working out in my house. So I really wanted to get a handstand. I was only doing it in my house. I lived in a heritage house and the room was, my whole room was the size of this. My bed came out from under my TV. I pushed my bed away and I do handstands. And then what I was like, I was like, I need a community. I need people. So what I did is I started an outdoor community where we gather on every Sundays where we could learn and grow together. So, you know, every week I know I'm going to connect with people who care about similar things that I do, have similar interests and where I could just be. Yeah. And that was one of the like one of the biggest things for me in my life, because I was like a year and a bit of time. Right. Maybe even more. And, you know, having a community going outside and moving. Right. Being able to touch the earth and learn new things, have fun, be playful, you know? Um, so like stop taking myself so seriously, right? So that's like some of my exercises are unique and it's partly because it's fun, right? And the other part is because when you do this stuff, you can't be mad. You know what I mean? Like you can't be mad and do a cartwheel. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you can, right? So like when you're sad, like go do a cartwheel. <laughs> You know what I mean? See what happens. Yeah. So there's that of like, if you want to elevate your state right away, those are some things. But then journaling was huge. Like I started journaling when I was in Kamloops and that was amazing for me because it really, I really started to notice patterns. And I was like, I would look out like, oh, you do that a lot. Or like, <laughs> oh, you did that ex like six months ago and you're still doing that now. Why? You know what I mean? And I was able to like have some accountability for myself. So the journaling was really amazing for me. The, I meditated, I started meditation and that was amazing for me. Cause like at one point when I would finish playing basketball, I hated basketball. You know, I hated my coach. I hated that. Right. I was and, in the exact same right? when I left UBC. Right? I didn't hate anyone there. I just mm -hmm. like hated the idea of the whole thing. I was just over it. I yeah, was sick of it. I was exactly. sick of waking up at 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. and going to practice that I didn't want to be at. I was sick of getting there 30 minutes early, got my ankles taped. Yeah. I was just like, yeah, I was so done. <laughs> exactly, right? So for me, at that time, I started to meditate. And I was able to see what was going on and see, like, why would you be mad at this guy? You know what I mean? He's doing his best. He's so passionate about yeah. what he does. 
he doesn't know anything better. So I was able to get these perspectives from meditation, from reading, and just learning alternative perspectives was able to broaden my perspective. And then now I look at it as like, now I look, everyone is doing their best, right? So even I'm doing my best. And that allows me and others to have like leeway to mess up, to make mistakes and to not, you know, hold it against myself or hold it against others. Because that's usually what it is. It's like, you know, you feel something should have happened. It didn't happen. And, you know, you're angry about it. You're mad about it. And it builds up over time. And then it just stays with you, mm. you know? So, um, yeah, that meditation, just the learning, reading, um, rapping, freestyling is huge for me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's big. That's big therapy. Um, yeah, there's really so many things. But those are like a lot. Those are some really important ones for me and food we're gonna get into food i want to talk a lot about food okay okay one thing on what you just said of like what i want to touch on is i realized a few years ago that i can only control what i'm doing Mm -hmm. i can't control what anyone else is doing Mm -hmm. and even just replaying that line in my head of just i'm only in control of myself i can't control what other people are doing Mm. almost allows a little bit of freedom in just understanding that what someone else, I can't let what someone else does affect me. Yeah. Because it will always end up in, ne- like I'll never be able to solve anything that someone else does because yeah. I can't control them. Mm-hmm. Even because you were, what you just brought up was like, you were upset at your coach and, mm-hmm. and you understood that they were trying to do their yeah. best, which is one way of looking at it. But mm-hmm. I was just more from the side of, I just can't control what they're going to do. So I can't worry about it. Yeah. Straight up. Like, Hey, let me do what I can. Yeah. You know, and just focus on that and not waste any energy. Yeah. It's so important. Such a valuable insight. How did you, this is something I've never really got into, but how do you meditate? Um, I'm varied. Like I meditate different every day. For example, today I, today I lie down and I put on some music. Um, it was like some Ethiopian church music and re- a harp. And I just breathe, kind of like box breathing. Yeah. And I just inhale, be mindful of my inhale, exhale, mindful. And sometimes I do breath holds. Um, but that's kind of like the baseline of what I do right now. But then I also love guided meditations. I also love to do chanting. I also love to, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's it but yeah those what's ones. the goal with meditation for me is the goal is to just be awesome at life you know to just live a life like live your life you know if i didn't have to meditate i wouldn't meditate for one second i wouldn't i don't want to be good at meditating that's the last <laughs> thing i want to be good at you know what i mean i don't want to be i want to be good at life i want to be able to have problems come into my life And I could look at it and be like, hey, I can't control that. And then, oh, I can control this though. And then do that. You know what I mean? That's like my goal is be able to act from that space. And I find that meditation has helped me get into that space and has helped me realize, um, like kind of separate from what's happening in my life and to how I feel about that thing. So yeah, that's the thing. And Tara Brock said, meditation is, is the adaptation for the modern day human to be at their best right so that's it it's just like for us to be at our best like let's meditate (laughs) yeah i let me maybe like change what i just said i said i've never meditated i've never like formally sat down closed my eyes you know Mm. what you assume is meditation crossing your legs and being like um you know that bullshit but i think for me and I refer to it as kind of mental therapy yeah. is exercise in the last couple of years. Yes. So for me, I was obviously, you know, my basketball history, but after basketball, getting into real estate, I was like work 24 seven mm-hmm. all day, every day for three years. Yeah. And I got overweight, not over. I don't know. I was just chubby. No just way. Like you got was like, pictures? Oh. <laughs> you got pictures? So you remember me as a kid, I was super skinny, right? <laughs> yeah. A little bit of muscle definition, yeah, but more just like pictures? skinny. <laughs> Well, you can probably see my Instagram. I want to see. I'm going to go back. <laughs> it was, I was at my biggest January 2017. Okay. It was like just over two years ago. Mm-hmm. I was 210. 
and now I weigh like 180, 185. Yeah. And big life changes for me, but also just like I was sick of feeling like garbage. Mm -hmm. And so I just started like, it was like five to seven minutes a day running. Yeah. And then it turned into 10 and then it turned into a workout. Amazing. And now 2019, I'm, I don't know if this is necessarily good for my body, but I don't care. Yeah. It's more just to like prove I can do it. Yeah. And because those like 30 to 60 minutes that I'm exercising every day yeah. are like a big mental refresh for me. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to, I'm working out or hiking or running every single day in 2019. Amazing. 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 And you've kept it. Is that it? bad for you? You've kept it up until now? Oh yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Whatever now is 30, no, 92 days, 90, yeah. something like that. Somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Is it bad for you? Like anything can be bad. But as long as you know your purpose, I feel like you yeah. have a greater purpose for it. So, you know, let's fulfill that. You totally. Know I mean? You made that choice. Like, yes, you know? my body feels better, but it's more like it's a mental thing for me. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, you know, so as I left kind of like the physical, the placing the importance on physical things, yeah. I kind of left exercise away and like in that importance on it. But when I was meditating, what I did come to realize is like, tell me if you think about this. When we were getting shots up, just us in the gym, like by yourself, that to me is meditation. Like what, were, what was your thoughts? Like what was your headspace at during those times? Mm. It's hard. Like I guess meditation is so wide that mm-hmm. it's hard to narrow it down into one thing, but... <laughs> I've never really thought about that, but I think it was always more when I was shooting, I was like consciously trying to think that I'm getting better than my competition because Mm. I'm putting in more time. Yeah. I don't know if it was necessarily like the way that exercise is for me now today. Yeah. But obviously you're by yourself and there's a lot of time to think, right? Yeah. (laughs) A whole lot. I don't know. Maybe I'll come back to that because I am kind of drawing a blank. Mm Mm-hmm. But for me, it was always like, I need to do this so I can beat this person. Yeah. I need to get up 400 shots today Mm -hmm. so that I'm better than this person. Yeah. And that when I play them in a month from now in lower mainlands or whatever, I'm going to win. I I see that. Yes. And for me, even just talking it out now, it was a way that I built confidence in myself. Mm -hmm. So I, I built confidence by doing. And then when I was in competition, that's, I would like re, I guess I would work backwards and be like, I've, I put in more shots than this person. I'm going to win today. I'm yeah. Gonna, this is literally the way I warmed up mm-hmm. in, in high school. Yes. University, I guess university too. That and explains I, a lot. In high school, <laughs> I warmed up and I was literally, I would look around and I'd be like, I'm the best player in this gym right now. Yeah. And so I don't know where that confidence came from, but mm-hmm. I think it was just the amount of work that I put in. Yeah. And I think I almost needed that amount of work to be that confident, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. So let's go back to these dark times, <laughs> right? <laughs> let's go back to these dark times and the, the bad days mm-hmm. and touch on what you just brought up. Because I feel that's something so important about building that confidence, mm-hmm. right? Building that trust in yourself that is so important because when we do that and we build that trust and that confidence, that is what I feel like stops us from going down and having these bad days for an extended period of time again. Because usually, for me at least, I was, I was in my bad days when I had no confidence because I couldn't get myself to really do anything, right? But the way I'm seeing it now is like it's just those little things every day, like how you started with five minutes a day of running. And that built into now, like you're doing it every day. It's been 90 something days, right? So think about like, if we're able to do that and build that confidence, just like that, starting with five minutes a day, that's like a powerful, like investment into our, into good days for the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This quote that I've heard a few times in different podcasts recently, um, People overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in a decade. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like coming back to that in starting in five minutes. Yeah. So you think, let's say I'm 250 pounds, I'm overweight, I want to lose 30 pounds or whatever it is. Yeah. Getting from 250 to 210 or whatever your goal is, 
seems like a big challenge. Yeah. But when you look at it in long term, if you do those little things every day, if you start with a five minute run, then do mm-hmm. six minutes the next day, then the week after do seven and a half, you know, yeah. then you just like building this confidence in yourself yeah. slash building, I guess, muscle and stamina and all of that that goes along into yeah. getting to that goal, which mm-hmm. is a long term goal, right? Yeah. And that's the most, to me, that's like the most powerful thing that we can do is to bring something that's in our mind, like a thought to make it something that we could actually feel and see and like, oh, this real. That's like the most powerful thing. And that's confidence. You have confidence that you could create, right? And it's just, you know, doing those little things daily and building it up from there. And this past New Year's, right? It was like, we all have these big New Year's resolutions, (laughs) right? And then this year, I really just had a switch of like, why something so big (laughs) why don't we make it so small you know why don't we just focus on like one day or like one little thing each day and just see how that builds up over time you know so it's that little little thing each day is so important it's so important and yeah crazy i thought about that this year actually too going into january And I almost switched my mindset in terms of like how I made goals Mm -hmm. into things that I could control. Mm -hmm. So like working out every day, I can do that if I want to. I can wake up and go for a run. I can wake up half an hour earlier than I should for work and go for a run. Whereas like in the past, a lot of my goals were, you know, like make the NCAA. Yeah. And then more recently, like this X number of sales Mm -hmm. that we want for a real estate team. Yeah. Yes, there's things I can do to get in a position to get to that level and Mm -hmm. to that number. But if interest rates rise and uh, whatever, Trump says something stupid and global markets go down 15% overnight, like Mm -hmm. I can't control that stuff. Yeah. So I almost switched my mindset into like making goals that no matter what happens, I can control and achieve. Mm -hmm. So, So important. And that's like more process focused right instead of that outcome yeah right and yeah it's these little switches so so powerful so important fitness has obviously been a big part of your life Mm -hmm. i guess what does it mean for you because obviously i know that you are in phenomenal shape Mm -hmm. and you have one of the best six packs i've ever seen (laughs) you want to see this but like i And as far as I can remember, the first time I met you, you're always like in really good shape. Yeah. So why is it such a big part of your life? Um, It started off just... Was it to be your brother? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, like one, like I had to be strong, you know? But I remember reading a Mark McGuire um, in a magazine, a child's magazine. I forget which one, but it was talking about he has like 18 inch biceps. And it was talking about how you could work out as a child. And I was probably like 10 or 12 at this time. And I started working out then. You know, my mom had her little weights, like five, 10 pound weights. <laughs> I was like doing push ups. And, you know, my friend told me a story of his, his dad had a friend who did 100 sit ups, 100 um, something, something, 100 something, something, right? Is that the, the challenge thing, right? I think it's 100 push ups, 100 sit ups, 100 chin ups. Is that what you're talking about? No, it was like, it oh. was like just like on the playground. We oh. were still in elementary, like grade three. You know what I mean? And like some story about a dad's friend. <laughs> and I took that, right? I really took it. And what fitness was for me, it shifted over time. And what fitness was for me when I first really picked it up was that was me. Like there was no separation between Akeem and fitness. You know, I had no other identity. So fitness was everything. Mm. You know, I got injured. I was injured mentally. I was distraught. I was, you know, torn apart right? I couldn't play basketball. Oh, you did the worst thing for me, you know? So that was like my biggest thing. Fitness was me, right? But then when I really got injured at UBC and I really couldn't do the things I wanted to do, I was like, uh, who's Akeem? You know, I was like totally lost, right? And then I kind of left fitness at that time because I was like, I didn't know where it fit in my life. Yeah. And then I picked it back up. Like I was saying, when I wanted to learn something and I, um, I wanted to, you know, learn the handstand and I wanted to meet people. So for now, for me, fitness is, 
is like a way that one that we could make these promises to ourselves like you were saying like hey i can control i can go 30 minutes each day get this workout and get this run in so now i look at it as like it's one of the easiest ways that we could just challenge ourselves like when you don't want to do it you can do it just push yourself one more rep or do one more thing so for me fitness is now like that vehicle for me to you know become like the greatest version of myself like for me to be my best self it's that vehicle for that and also it's really a a place where i i play and i i learn and it's a way that i like i look at developing my brain i learn new things fitness wise i engage you know um with my hands and my feet onto the floor so i think of it with my brain so now it's just a way for me to you know be in my yeah best best version best self and you know my highest potential and just also to feel good it just feels good man so you know all those things is what it is to me now there's days where i wake up and i'm like today's gonna be that day that i'm i'm not gonna do it yeah you know i had too much vodka the night before or i just didn't sleep or whatever Mm -hmm. but no matter what i've never had a workout that I feel worse after than I did before. That's right. never happened. No, nope, never happened. Zero happens. times. Right. And so that's what I'll tell myself is like, I just need to go for a run for half an hour, do a hike or do a workout. I'll feel better. Yeah. And it always, always is, is the case. Mm-hmm. So you it's know? almost, it's going back to that thing of like learning mm-hmm. and one, it keeps building confidence in myself, but yeah. just understanding that I'll feel better afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> it's so cool. You know, it's so, it's so powerful. And you know, once like, I separated the like the looks and fitness is going to get me into scholarship, get me to, you know, be be seen by people. Once I remove that from it and then we're able to see like all these other benefits of fitness and then we're able to take away the pressure of fitness. Because Sometimes you don't even need to go that hard. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not even about how hard you go or, you know, it's just about doing the thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's just about doing it. So once I was able to release from all that like that vanity fitness then it's like whoa this is like an amazing tool that we have at our disposal there is in the summer i'm fairly competitive with myself in doing this specific hike that i like doing yeah but other than that like i run i'd say i run five or six days a week and most of the time it's like six or seven k and i don't want to go longer because it's too time consuming and i get bored yeah but like, I don't time myself. I'm not trying to beat a time. It's more just like, for me, it's that mental release every day mm-hmm. that I get to kind of like unwind a little bit. Yeah. I answer my phone sometimes, but I probably shouldn't answer my phone when I'm running. <laughs> but I, like you said, for me, it's not a competitive thing. It's not mm-hmm. like I'm trying to beat a time or train for a marathon or yeah. anything like that. It's just using it as a mental break almost. Yeah, truly. And going back to like me and like my doubt, right? I tried to outthink my mind and it didn't work (laughs) like no you don't think that no you can do it oh yeah you get it didn't work for me and now like the fitness is for me to to not even think to my mind but to prove to my mind that i can do it oh you didn't think you could do it watch yeah you know what i mean watch so now it's that now it's like with this inner dialogue that i have inside fitness is that way where i like haha i won today you know like (laughs) got you so i i have like a like a battle in my mind with these kind of things you know i'm like i got you today (laughs) on the next episode of (laughs) keen versus his mind (laughs) that'd be a crazy show (laughs) oh wow crazy (laughs) how'd you get into training or why did you get into training why because i was so beat up man so I was like destroyed. My body was just messed up. And then I... So you like wanted to help people not be in that situation? Well, I stopped. I wasn't going to be a trainer. I wasn't going to do anything sports, athletic wise. Yeah. And then I went on to like my own journey of like exploring the body. And I went out to Columbia and I saw everyone just out in the park doing pull-up workouts and just, you know, body weight stuff. So I did that. And then I, you know, went down a YouTube rabbit hole and I find different people doing this amazing stuff. And I, you know, I learned about things that I feel I should have learned being in the level I was playing basketball at. You know what I mean? Like 
wait, <laughs> why didn't you tell me this, top trainer? Yeah. You know what I mean? Why yeah. didn't you tell me this, coach? Right? Um, so I was learning a lot of things. That I'm like, hey, we should know this stuff. Like, how come we don't know this? So then once I applied that to myself, then I was like, you know, let's share this. I became passionate about it. Then I was like, why not? You know, like, let's share this. I love it. I'm deep in it right now. So let's, let's take it and see where it goes. So what's your style when you're training? Mine is mindful, mindful movement, body weight. Yeah, mindful movement, mainly body weight, a mix of gymnastics and calisthenics, mix of like a, a yoga kind of vibe, like uh, internal, like a qigong, like flowing. And um, yeah, that's, it's, it's more of like explorative explorative movement and you get to your fitness goals while having fun and while exploring and learning new different things so that's like more of mine what i love to teach yeah. so it's a lot of like <clears throat> mental health rather than just learning a technique or whatever right yeah big time so like i even just i was like all my all my students they're not like just physical training it's doing so much more than just physical training. So I even just like stopped now. And like now the new ones that they come on, it's like, yo, we're doing it all. You know, so now it's just clear and we don't have to like, you know, like kind of like play around with it. So it's like so much more than that. And it's definitely about finding what works for you, right? Like finding the balance. So whatever I do teach as well, I teach it with the mindset of like, what would be the best for that person so they can continue it when I'm gone. Like, you know, what's going to be the best for this person so they actually enjoy it. You know what I mean? So like, I'm not the guy you come to to learn, lose 30 pounds. I'm, you know what I mean? I'm not that guy. I'm not the guy you come to if you just want to, you know, just get whooped and get out. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm going to ask you questions like, you know, how does that feel? You know, like, like, what does it feel like to have this movement back? You know what I mean? Internalize this feeling so when you don't feel it, you know, you know what I mean? Yep. These are the kind of things that like I do and it's definitely more than more than the movement, more than the training. Um, but it's an awesome vehicle the movement to to be able to to share that message. Are you talking to what do you call them? Clients? Do you call them clients? I, I say know. students, but students, clients, yeah. yeah. Do you talk to students about nutrition as well? Yeah. Is that a big part? Big part. Yeah. Yeah, big part. How'd you get into uh do you, are you 100% vegan now? Yeah, I am. How long has that been? Um, well, I wouldn't even say I'm 100% vegan. I eat honey. Uh, <laughs> and like I may have leather shoes on, but I eat plant-based. Yeah. And that's been about two and a half years since I started. So can you define vegan? Is vegan like zero things that come from animals? Yeah. Is that what it is? I'm quite sure vegan is like zero things that come from animals. Vegan is like you don't wear any leather, you don't yep. wear wool, you don't um, care for humans. It shows. But you automatically hate anyone that's not a vegan. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and then you eat plant based, you know? Um, yeah, but I don't say I classify myself as that because, like, you know, I will, like, I do have honey and I'm not. Like, I'm not mad at the industries, you know, I just mm -hmm. understand and I know I don't want to take part in that. And I'm not like, yeah, like, it's more of a personal thing. Like, it's for my own self. And I just so happen, like, you could fit me under inside the box of being a vegan. But it's not like, oh, I want to be a vegan. Yeah. You know, it's just came from hurt at the end of the day, like wanting to heal and wanting to do better and be better, you know? How long ago was that that you decided to do that? Um, well, I did it two and a half years ago, and it was a, like probably like a year transition, but it wasn't even a transition like, oh, I'm going to only eat plants. You know, it's just like, yo, you've eaten eggs every day for six years. <laughs> like, what do you do when you stop eating eggs? You know, and then I started to have smoothies and... I was so energized, so lively. Then I had smoothies for like six days, only smoothies. You know what I mean? And I was like, this is awesome, but not practical socially, right? <laughs> yeah. 
And then I was like, then I just started to take that kind of experimental approach. Like not even, it's still vegan, but I was like, what if I don't eat oats? You know, I'm not going to eat oats for one week. Let's see what I come up with. Oh, I feel so much better without oats. Oh my gosh. And then, you know, I just basically did that kind of stuff with, okay, I, I learned a little something resonates with me. Let me try it out. And then eventually I ended up being plant-based. So was the decision just to not, <clears throat> it wasn't like you were feeling poorly. It was more just to not harm animals. What was like, what was the decision? Going yeah. On? That's what so it was. So initially I started to be mindful of what I was eating because I was feeling poorly. Right. But okay. that didn't cause me to go vegan. Right. So it was about a year and a half of being, well, even like three years, you could say, because when I was in Colombia, I saw in their pharmacies, they had herbs like maca, you know, it had these different herbs in pharmacy. So it drew my interest. But then when I came back, I had no clue what to eat. And I had like trauma with food, you know, because when I was playing basketball, my last two years when I was in Kamloops, before every game on the road, we would eat pasta with meat sauce. Like that was, you <laughs> needed to eat pasta with meat sauce. Just carb loading all yeah, the time, like, yeah. It was like three hours before, two hours, whatever it was before, pasta meat sauce. That's the best for everybody, right? So we'd eat that and every halftime, I was sick every end of the game. Just crash, yeah. Yeah, I was like, like, I couldn't go out with the team. I couldn't enjoy myself. My stomach was hurt. I wanted to throw up. So um, it was like, I had no clue really what to eat, but it was at that time I was like, let me try eating hemp seeds, you know? And then I kind of left a couple years, oh, my cousin in uh, pharmacies. And then um, it was, you know, just diving deeper into like one of like how to become, how to have everything in my life line up, right? So it started really with meditation and journaling when I was in that down space, right? And then that led me to you know, thinking out of the box and like wanting to live outside of the box. And I started to like have, I uh, started to like, yeah, like think about, um, think outside of like my current way of thinking. So like I questioned, why was I training so much? What is this actually doing for me? Yeah. Then I questioned like, why do I think like this? What is that doing for me? Why do I hang around these people? Why do I eat like this? And I basically just like, one by one, I like went through all these things. And with food, I went down that hole of like, well, why do we eat these things? Like what? Right. And then why was I at a &W every day like, <laughs> as an athlete? Like, why did they tell me to have um, blizzards to gain weight? You know, like, and then I went down that and then I wasn't vegan, but I felt better. I was eating like bison. I was having like, like rice, pasta. I was you know, having salads, like colorful foods. I wasn't even vegan at that time. But that was like the entry point of like just being mindful of what I ate because I didn't feel good. Mm -hmm. But then it was like, hey, I actually feel better now. Let's learn more. And then, you know, just keep going with that passion and just following that. And then I ended up, you know, uh, one, I had a cousin in St. Lucia who is big. He's, he's a plant-based Rasta and I learned a lot from him and Dr. Sebi. He taught me a lot. And just learning from them, I was like, hmm, let me try it. And I tried it and then I did it. Yeah, but you know what's actually funny is that in how it happened, I was in Tanzania in Africa and there's so many fruits around. So I was like, why don't I just try eating only fruits? And like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And then there was this one feast that we had that was vegan. I was like, I can do this. And then basically since then I did it. Yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> what um you mentioned you started feeling better, but what does that mean? Cuz I'm sure a lot of people that are still eating a lot of meat and mm -hmm. a lot of pasta don't really understand what feeling better than what you're used to is. Yeah. So what felt better? Um for me, one was I was able to have a control, more of a control over how I felt. So I knew that, hey, I need a good sleep tonight. I know what to eat today for that. I need to be energized for this basketball game. Oh, I know what to eat for that. Oh, I won't be able to eat because I have a long work shift. Oh, I know how to prepare for that. So I was just like, I wasn't just like randomly eating and like all of a sudden like, oh, I don't know why I feel this way or why do I feel tired when I'm supposed to be energized? Why am I energized when I'm supposed to be tired? Mm -hmm. So I feel that was one thing. 
And then also just going to the washroom was smooth. Like, <laughs> honestly, like I used to be like, oh no, I'm going to spend like half hour in the washroom. Like, it's like, let me wait till after, you know what I mean? But now it's just like, I can go to the washroom, release and be done and be like, oh, that felt good. You know, before it was like, I was sitting on the toilet and it was like, it, it was an event, you know? So really? this being able to, you know, be feeling light, feeling light, not feeling like I have so much stuck in me and feeling, yeah, so heavy. So I was able to release and feel light and just go about my day. Do you miss anything about eating animal product? Meat? Um, it's weird, but I really don't. Yeah. It's like, it's so weird. When I think about it, what would I, if I miss anything? Um, like fish, taste maybe? anything? No. No? Fish, because, yeah. Yeah, maybe fish because I really love fish before I switched over to plant-based. And I, yeah, I really love salmon. Um, that's probably the only thing, but it's not like I even have a desire to eat that now. But what I could say is I miss just the ease because it's so much easier. Now I have to be so creative. Mm. I have to think about how to mix different foods. I have to think about, you know, what's this. But when you have, when you're eating meat, it's so much easier. Yeah. Pick a protein, <clears throat> like pick a carb. Do you want greens? Yeah, okay, let's put some <laughs> greens on the side. You know what I mean? But otherwise, like, you know, like, what are you going to have protein for? You know, you can only eat so much chickpeas. Lentils mess with my stomach, you know? So you kind of got to be creative. So, so what are some of your favorite meals, like, these days? What's it, your go-to? My go-to is, like, a, a curry. Like, a, the, same, the same feast that I had in Tanzania, I make that almost every day now. It was a chickpea and squash ragu chickpea and squash stew yeah. with um mashed squash and avocado and do you have their recipe somewhere that um, sounds really I good i basically <laughs> eat that every day do you? you know i basically eat that every day it's so easy put everything in one pot switch your vegetables switch your seasonings depending on how you like it and you know that's it so i basically still eat that i'm gonna go cook that later today you know <laughs> what are the biggest com um complaints about people wanting to eat healthier but not knowing one where to start, but seems like to me eating healthy is more expensive. Mm -hmm. Like buying organic food costs more money. Yeah. And then to the creative aspect. So mm -hmm. like, how would you, maybe someone that wants to eat healthier, wants to feel better, but is on a tighter budget or mm -hmm. has a kid that they need to feed as well. And, and so one, it takes more time to prepare, mm -hmm. but two, it costs more money. Yeah. Is that, is that even true? It could be, okay. right? If you're going to compare someone who cooks all their food and eats at home, then, and you compare that to, I want to now go from buying all my groceries, cooking all my food, to now buying all organic, that's going to be more expensive. But in reality, very few people are like that, yeah. right? Most people who eat unhealthy have unhealthy habits. They're unable to be consistent. They're unable to stick to something. They're unable to say no to something that they, you know, they know they shouldn't even eat, right? They, you know, they have those harder times. So when you look at it that way, it's not more expensive. Just eat out less yeah. and buy more groceries, right? Prepare your lunches. It's going to be so much cheaper, right? But um, so then from there, you could look at getting, instead of getting them to eat healthier, let's just get better habits. You know what I mean? So keep eating everything you want to eat. It's okay. But uh, don't eat two hours before bed. Try your best to not eat two hours before bed. And when you wake up, let's eat hour and a half. Or let's, when you wake up, drink water first thing in the morning. It's free. Oh, <laughs> easy. Right? You find people have a hard time doing that. Yeah. Right? So that would be like, you don't even have to switch what you eat. Just switch how you, like, how you organize and how you approach it first. Before anything, don't worry about switching. Don't go vegan yet. You know, just like, yeah, just when you go out to drink, know that you're drinking isn't really the thing that's going to make you gain weight. But what do you do when you drink? You eat so much garbage. <laughs> and it's you always the greasiest food. The yeah. greasiest food. What's open at that time? Poutine. So go out and drink. <laughs> go out and drink, but just tell yourself you're not going to eat. Or like 
I know you're not supposed to eat close to bedtime, but even like prepare a salad for yourself before you go out. Yeah. So that when you come home and you have the munchies, rather than stopping at McDonald's on the way, you're yes. eating a chicken salad or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Like just have those, those things set in place. So then you make it easier on yourself. You know, it's all about making it easy. Yeah. Really at the end of the day. That's the biggest thing for me is, is cooking is time consuming, mm -hmm. especially if you work a l long hours. It's mm -hmm. like, it's hard to be motivated to get home at eight or nine o'clock yeah. and then start preparing food. Yeah. So that is probably the biggest thing for me. Mm -hmm. I want to eat healthier. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to. Yeah. But it's, it's like, like you said, is the preparation. So even just having some lettuce available in the fridge yeah. so that I'm not picking up something on the way home, mm -hmm. I'm going home and just making a quick salad or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. And like to make it one, just a touch on the cost thing is like, it's an investment in future once again right yeah. we're investing in future you pay an extra 20 dollars each time you go grocery shopping now you're gonna save yourself thousands of dollars down the line right so we could look at it that way right um what is it the overestimate in one year underestimate 10 years same yeah. thing right same thing so you could look at it that way just that one thing but then also is like we're in this day and age where like there's so many creative solutions, right? So, you know, why don't you get one uh, meal prep a day where you buy like it's like twelve, fifteen dollars uh, each one. They deliver it to you. Yeah. All you got to do is warm it up. You know what I mean? So those are things that I'll say like, yeah, you're really busy. You know, um, what if you what do you think about just having one a day so you don't have to think about one uh, feast a day? You don't have to think about one thing you're eating a day. Just take that off. Release your stress. Make it easy. You know what I mean? So there's like those kind of things of what I think about when it comes to that. You just want to keep it super, super simple. Eh? It's almost like one meal at a time. That's, you have that one meal and you see how you feel and you continue, right? Yeah. Just keeping it and like planning in advance, you know? So like, you know, you're busy. You know that you're so busy that taking the food is going to actually cut into your revenue, cutting to your income. So you take right? shortcuts and get bad food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But why don't I just fuel myself why don't i take some of that extra income that i'm gonna be making because i'm not cooking and i eat something better which is also gonna allow me to make more money in the end of the day you know what i mean like i have like students that you know they they're having these health issues and it's like they're having to take work off you know and it's like hey just take like <laughs> you know what i mean like you either get the meal preps or you take this half an hour yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you know, so depending on where you're at. Mm -hmm. Carl had a question about vegans we were talking about earlier. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> What's with all the click clickiness, you know? Yeah. Like a lot, to, a lot of times on Instagram, like if anyone posts anything, like Joe Rogan does a lot, like meat or whatever, mm -hmm. he always gets attacked. Yeah. What's up with that? So food is the new religion. Yeah, that's what yeah. people are right? saying. Food eh? is the new religion. And we need, not we all, but a lot of us need something to hold on to right so what people hold on to now is food right so what they do is they have their whole identity as vegan as this, this per, like you know as this person it's just like it's like a community thing right yeah and within that community is like they forget about like it's crazy because i actually have met vegans who say i care about animals more than i care about myself Right. So that alone is just like, whoa, <laughs> you know, what I mean, that's like that tells a lot where people lost their whole sense of being and identity. Yeah. They don't care about other people anymore. They don't care about themselves really anymore. All they care about is like blindly spreading this message. Right. So that happens in a lot of different forms, a lot of different ways. And right now it's happening a lot with food, where food is our, is our religion. Just because it's such a big deal these days, right? Yeah. 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 And it's something that we hold on to so much. So like, like <laughs> it's so crazy because I had a friend and he wanted to try becoming vegan, right? And I'm not the guy to come to and be like, how do I do it? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> well, why do you want to do it? You yeah. know what I mean? I'm not the guy who's going to be like, oh, come, let me show you yeah. the ways. <laughs> you know what I mean? But he, he wanted to do it. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, so we support on the way, you know, I'd sh like come over for food and all that. And then what happened is he wasn't feeling the best on it. And then he started to go more to a carnivore diet. 
right? So one thing is he went from an extreme to an extreme, yeah. right? Slingshot, right? So they're just looking for something to hold on to, right? Because they forget that self is here, right? But I had this friend and when he went carnivore, he, he basically was like, hey, I know we're going our separate ways and we're kind of focused on different things right now, but you know, I still love you as a friend. I'm like, <laughs> like what? <laughs> like, I don't care about food like that. Like, like, my mission is like to spread love and to be around people who care and people who, you know, care for the planet and love themselves and love others. And, you know, that's what I care about more. And then, but it just showed to me like, oh, but like a lot of people have their whole identity wrapped up in, in the foods and vegan, carnivore, keto, whatever it is, is like, don't you dare say something in the contrary <laughs> to them. You know what I mean? <laughs> don't you dare. Has anyone said anything to you about the honey? Um, no. No? Honestly, I don't find myself in too many of these vegan circles. Stay away from that. You yeah. know what I mean? I don't find myself too many you're, of You're that. just doing you. And yeah. I mean, you feel better, so you're just going to keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's funny, though. Like, I, <laughs> I do, I do, I do uh, find it hilarious. But I did consciously, like, when I stopped playing basketball, and I realized how much of my identity was wrapped up in basketball, I made the decision to not hold on to anything and not give my identity to anything external again in my life. So when I started to go into these Buddhist teachings, go into meditation, go into Hinduism, I was like, I don't want to be a hippie, you know, because the hippies are the same thing for vegans in the spiritual community, where they're going to bash you for you know for having garbage or for showering or whatever it may be you know what i mean uh, they're gonna you know put that and like be so angry at you and rah, and be so extreme right so what i would decide like i'm not gonna give my identity i'm gonna still go into anything that i do go into as myself and i'm gonna still keep whatever i do like and carry that with me i go into this vegan lifestyle i really like this i'm gonna keep that I like meditation, I'm gonna keep that, but I'm gonna put my own spin on it. Don't tell me I have to meditate this way. You know what I mean? You know, so that was, yeah, something I, I did consciously. You classify yourself as a very, or as a, as a spiritual person. Yeah. You just mentioned you explored a few different religions. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. Re how, when was that? That was like three, four years ago, like at the end of my basketball. You know, I'd be how looking at- How do you at even start to explore a new religion? It started from Alan Watts, right? Okay. Alan Watts uh, really, he showed me about, he told me about Buddhism and then Hinduism, right? And then from there is like learning about them, but he put it in a way where it's like a way of life. In the Western world, we don't really have ways of life. We have religion, right? So what I understood from what I heard from him was that it's a way of life. So this is not like something that you call yourself. It's how you are. Is okay. what you do, right? So with that, I was learning, and that's I would just like really go, okay, let's learn about Buddhism. Let's learn about you know the attachments of like what's the source of all suffering. Oh, I like that. I like that. I'm gonna keep that, you know. And then when I learn something else, oh, let me try that, you know. So it's like just being able to just go through and learn it. It's not like I guess I never was in a church or I was never in like a temple like that to have someone be like, no, you can't do that. So I was able to just be free with my exploration. So was it all like personal research on like their philosophies and stuff? Yeah, it was personal research. And then when I was in Kamloops, I go to meditation centers, Buddhist meditation centers to yeah. learn and be around people. And but otherwise, like I read my first book in university in my fourth, fifth year. You know what I mean? I, I, <laughs> it's so crazy to say that, but <laughs> I read my first book. I started to go to the library. Oh, let me get this book on Zen. Let me get this You'd book on- You never read a book before? No, like not a full book. Spark really? Notes. Holy Spark <laughs> Notes. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So then I just started to learn and then, yeah, explore in that sense. What does the continual education process look like for you? Do you read lots? Obviously, meditation um, is part of it. Meditation is part of it. I'm like a content consumer. I'm a junkie. 
Like, honestly, I'm a junkie. I spend so much time consuming content, spend so much time listening to audiobooks, like three hour talks on YouTube. I will watch the whole thing. You know, I'm there's a quote. Tim Ferriss put it out in his um, like his Friday newsletter. I forget who said it, but it was like. The. Like the biggest enemy to good research is being overbooked. You will lose years by not being able to, you'll waste years by not being able to waste hours, mm. right? So I waste hours. <laughs> I waste <laughs> hours <laughs> learning, researching, studying, like thinking about things. I waste hours. And when I was working, this is why I'm self-employed now, because when I was getting my hourly wage at, as a trainer, I was having to work eight hours a day in order to make enough money, right? But now I'm able to work a third or even a quarter of that, make the same money, have all this time to do other things. And it's like, oh, I was able to learn a lot by making that switch, by giving myself the space and freedom to learn. Do you listen to podcasts? Yes. A lot? A lot. What are some of your favorite ones? My favorite ones, I recently started to really listen to Tom Bilyeu, Impact Theory. Tom, oh. how do you, what's his last name? Tom Bilyeu, B-I-L-Y-E-U. So I really started listening to him, his podcast, um, yeah, do you, recently. Do you listen to Sam Harris? No. No? no. What's Tom me. Bilyeu about? Because I don't, I don't know him. He's all about ownership he's all about making impact fulfillment he's all about like those practical tools for you to be in your highest fulfillment like your your best best self so he has people come on and he's amazing because when he comes on he his in his intro gets all the the normal talking points for all these other podcasts out of the way he'll tell every single thing that they've ever said right in the intro and then for the rest of the podcast he talks about other stuff that they wouldn't talk about in other podcasts he talk about nitty gritty stuff so then he gets really into the details of people's lives and the actual tactic of how to do things hmm. so that's that's one i really love it's too short an hour each episode like <laughs> does but, he put out a lot though yeah he puts out a lot probably twice a week he has uh, that relationship theory and health theory so a more health based one so awesome people on it. That's one that I really love. And then Ben Greenfield podcast for more health and like, yeah, more health and optimization of the, of the being and a model health show is one. And yeah, those are the main, but right now it's really Tom Bilyeu impact mm -hmm. theory. That's interesting. <clears throat> how we just like in the intro, how long are his intros then? Sometimes like two, three minutes. Oh, okay, that's all. Yeah. Okay. I thought it would be longer. If he's just like outlining who the person is and like what they've talked about on other podcasts and kind yeah. of like an overview. Yeah. And then he's just like picking something super specific. And is it like mentality of how they're getting through situations or is it like how they feel about something specific or what? It would be like, say how you asked me the question about like, like, how, were you always happy? Were you always positive? Yeah. And then going through the process of how I was able to get through my thing, mm. right? So his is more on like tactical, practical base of like, what did these actual, what did they do? You know, when you were in your relationship and you were yelling and screaming at each other and you're still together now, what did you do? And then you're like, oh, you had this mindset. Well, how did you get your partner to develop a growth mindset? You know, so then they really get into the, the finer details of, of, the, of the life of the person. Cool. Does he have, like, what are the types of guests he has on? Um, he has, like, do you know David Goggins? Yeah. David Goggins was one huge one. He has a lot of... The... Speaking of that type of person, I was listening to Joe Rogan today. And what's this guy's name? Colin O'Brady. Colin O'Brady, I don't know. He uh, he was on Joe Rogan's February 11th podcast. He uh, is the first person ever to cross Antarctica by himself. 
So he had a 375 pound sled <laughs> yeah. that was just like filled with food and supplies and stuff. Yeah. And it was literally him crossing the whole continent. Dang. It's never been done before. People have tried doing it and died. Dang. He did it. Wow. You know, in 54 days. It's so amazing. It was a thousand man. miles. It's amazing. Yeah. And just the fact that we're able to hear these stories, you know, and like hear this person talking, it's amazing. But he has, yeah, like okay. those kind of like impactful people in yeah. that world. Um, I can't even really think of others. He has like a lot of people who like no clue about who are really good in their genre. Very specific and, like, field. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Those are the type of people I really like talking to. Though. Yes. Is someone one, you have to be passionate about what you do, mm-hmm. but two, just like a pro in your very specific yeah. field. Mm-hmm. Like, tomorrow yeah. we have a photographer coming on what oh, am yeah. i going to say to a photographer i have no idea just, yeah. let's see what happens yeah. Kind of thing, right? <laughs> yeah it's so amazing man and just these ability to connect is so blessed but he had you know who dane dash is no yeah, yeah. he's no. like the guy who started rockefeller with jay-z oh okay oh, well, that's had, why it's familiar yeah, yeah. yeah he had dane dash on his podcast and it's like so random <laughs> but it's like such an amazing podcast yeah, <laughs> yeah it's so blessed but yeah Taking so much information, man. So much. I'm getting there. In the last year, I've become like ultra curious Mm -hmm. and wanting to just learn as much as I can. Yeah. And so whenever people are excited about learning, I'm Mm -hmm. like excited to ask them what their go-tos are. Yeah. And for me, it's a lot of, I'm in the car like a lot during Mm -hmm. my day. Mm -hmm. So podcasts are super easy. Mm -hmm. Whenever I'm working out, it's podcasts. It's not really music that often. But that's for me the way where i've found a lot of education is just like what i like hearing is real people's like real life experiences mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. rather than i feel like a lot of books are edited towards a certain audience yeah. or and it's scripted it's like it's a professionally written yeah like edited someone book, probably right? wrote it for the person who actually has that mm-hmm. knowledge right so that's what i like about podcasts is mm-hmm. just like in the moment real life this is what actually happened yeah. and this is how I got through it. And this mm-hmm. is the feelings that I had going through it, Yeah, which has been super beneficial to me. And yeah. it just motivates the shit out of me. So obviously the podcast, we started in October, November mm-hmm. and in listening to other people's podcasts, it just gives me ideas of who I want on the show. Cause I'm like, Oh, this is such a cool topic. Yeah. I have so many questions on this. Mm-hmm. I'm going to Google like who are the best people in BC in this specific topic mm-hmm. and try to get them on the show. Yeah. So yeah, it's motivating man. as hell too. Yeah, and like, even like you're, you're doing a lot of doing, right? Which is <laughs> yeah, that that's huge. Yeah, you know, you're doing a lot of doing. Just from what I heard, like you're working a lot. You know, busy, right? So it's like you're kind of limited in how much you could really learn from not doing because yeah. you're always doing, yeah. and doing teaches you a lot as well. Yeah, right. So you're doing like, you're doing a lot, learning a lot from your like hands-on application of things, which is something for me right now is like, all right, let's get more to doing. Let's get more to that hands-on going out there and seeing how far I can take it Hmm. and then learning from that. You know what I mean? I've figured out that I learn a lot better and a lot more by doing something and failing Mm -hmm. than over-researching and not doing anything. Yeah. So and I think sports taught me that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just like sports is really good for learning how to fail, right? Because you basically you almost lose so much. You yeah. always fail. Yeah. Right? Like there's one provincial champion, there's one national champion, mm-hmm. there's one NBA champion per year. Everyone else is a loser. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And like watching Kobe videos all night, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm watching Kobe. Like, <laughs> remember in high school, it was like VHSs back in the day, right? Maybe DVDs just came out. I don't know. <laughs> So I had this VHS of like Michael Jordan highlights and yeah. I must, must have watched it like 1200 times. Like it was insane. Mm-hmm. My dad had this little portable TV that I was remember like that too. this yeah. big yeah, with a VCR like attached to it. <laughs> and so I used to plug this in in my room and just like put this Michael Jordan highlight tape in. Yeah. Watch it all night. <laughs> yeah, it was the same. That is wild, man. Yeah. yeah it's, 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 it's funny how similar our, uh, competitive backgrounds are just like battling with your brother you know and then getting sick about basketball being my entire identity yeah until i was like 20 21 mm-hmm. and figuring out that i hated it or 
stop loving it. Yeah. And then just using that energy somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And I remember you coming to UBC at that time Mm -hmm. and just knowing and feeling that from you and knowing and feeling a little bit of myself in that state. You know what I mean? Really? Yeah. Because I, I'm sure it wasn't that hard to, I don't, I don't think I hit it very well. But like I was not into it at all, mm-hmm. and so it's interesting to hear that. Yeah, you like, felt it. Yeah, like could feel it. You know what compared I mean? Compared to like provincial teams, right? Compared, yeah, exactly. And it was it was interesting because I actually played for Dell at, in Kamloops. He coached TRU. He then. coached TRU. Then, yeah. Okay, and cool. I knew he moved up for a bit. I just didn't. I didn't know it was yeah, one Yeah, he okay. coached. He was assistant coach at TRU for. The one year or one year I was there and he sat me down in his office at the end of the year and we were having like our end of the year wrap ups. And he's like, Akeem, I just don't see that same zest. Like, I forget the exact word he said, but he said, you're, you look jaded and Mm. you seem jaded. You're not just that pure child from provincial team. And I was like, yeah, I'm not (laughs) like, I've seen things now. I know, you know what I mean? I, I can't just like give it all out and like, you know, be like, oh yeah, I would go there. Yeah, I'm there. You know, go here. I actually had some things, other things that I was thinking about beside basketball. And it was evident at that time that I wasn't like, just like that same, that same guy who like closed the eyes, like only focused on basketball, you know? I've been, have you been like that at other points in your life or was it, was the biggest let's say depressive state was just like figuring out the basketball wasn't your identity anymore. Cause for me it was that, that year at UBC for me was mm-hmm. re- like bad mentally. Yeah. yeah. And going through it, it was the first time really for me. And mm-hmm. I didn't know how to overcome that. Okay. Basketball is not my life anymore. What do mm-hmm. I do now? Mm-hmm. There was also a job that I had a few years later where it was like six months of pain and every yeah. day waking up was like, Oh, do you think I could call in sick? The last time I called in sick was two weeks ago. Is that too close together? Like those thoughts were going through my head every day I woke up. Yes. Was there another point that you, or was that the big depression spiral, you know, low Mm -hmm. point? That was the big one for me Mm -hmm. because it lasted, because I played for years while it still happened, right? Yeah. Um, And after that, when I stopped playing, what I decided is I'm going to leave the country, leave the continent because I didn't want to be around anyone who had my basketball identity around. Like I didn't want any of that talk. So I went to Columbia and then came back. And, you know, I could say the time when I was working at the gym and I was like, oh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be here. Mm -hmm. But even at that time, I feel like it was still just a lingering on of the previous. And I, I just needed that more time to work through it. And um, I wasn't like really ready or wanting to be under like a coach again, telling me what to do. Totally. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was like, I, 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 I feel that may be the thing. I was like, I think that's the issue. I don't like this, <laughs> this authority, you know, like telling me in like all the, like the, the games and like the kind of like pretending that you have to do the role playing, I should say, that mm-hmm. you have to do a really... I feel like that was the thing that I didn't really like. So I found that at the job, the gym I was at. And I was like, oh, I got to go. But then, yeah, I lasted like eight months and I was gone. <laughs> but yeah, that's. Yeah. That it's amazing. funny to look back and just realize. So I guess when I, because I only played at UBC for a year. Mm-hmm. I guess when I left, people weren't surprised. Mm-hmm. You weren't? No. <laughs> When did you come? I'm pretty sure you came in my second year. I was yes. playing at that time, right? It was my third year at university. So I went to the States for a year, then sat for a year because mm-hmm. you weren't allowed to play. Yeah. And then went yeah, to Yeah, so my second year. Yeah. Because, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, I redshirted. I went in there and like, I'm going to redshirt this year um, at that time. So I understood. Like, I felt you. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know uh, part of the reason I figured out that I didn't like basketball anymore or <laughs> I wasn't that into it was when the Olympics was here that year. Mm -hmm. And every week, every traveling week, we had one person that had to stay home. Mm -hmm. Remember that? I think there was like three or four of us. Yeah. And it just kind of rotated. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
<laughs> I was so happy that my week <laughs> to not go to Calgary, I remember this so vividly. Mm. We were playing in Calgary. My week to stay home was the week that the Olympics were here. Wow. And I was so much happier to stay home because I just wanted to party and go to the Olympics. Yeah. So that's when you knew you were checked out completely? Oh, 100%. Yeah. I was working. I was working three nights a week bartending. Jesus. While going to school. Not really going to school, but in, yeah. I was <laughs> in classes. I was enrolled in five classes. <laughs> I didn't really go to many of them. But I was working three nights a week. I don't know if you even knew this. No. So. I, in that year off, I just like bartended full time. Yeah. And then going back to school, one, I didn't want to take any student debt. Yeah. So I wanted to work to not have to take out loans. But two, I just like, liked making money. Yeah. And that was more fun for me than basketball. Mm -hmm. So I was still working three nights a week. So I was usually working Sunday, Monday, Tuesday mm -hmm. from like 5 p.m. to 1 a.m. Yeah. And then we had practice at 8 a.m. Yeah. But I was at a pub in Poco. Mm -hmm. So I'd have to drive back to UBC. Go to sleep at like two thirty three, and then be at practice eight. Crazy. Yeah, that's but wild. I, would, I was like, I was happier making money and mm -hmm. working than going to practice. You know, <laughs> that's a blessing that you were able to have that. And like, as you transitioned, you have something that you kind of took with you, for sure. You know, it's so interesting to look back and just realize that. I guess you don't really see a lot of that pain or I don't know what the right word is, but you don't really see it until you're like looking back at it. Mm -hmm. When you're in it, you're just like, oh, this sucks so much. Why am I doing this? Yeah. But when you look back, you realize that I can just get out of it. I can just leave. Yeah. Why don't people leave more often? You know, this right? is something bad really... relationship, bad mm -hmm. job, bad experience playing mm -hmm. athletics. Like mm -hmm. We weren't happy with anymore. Mm -hmm. Why don't people leave? I'll ask that as a question. Um, it's hard. It's so hard to leave, right? Because what happens on the other side Just is like uncertainty, yeah. right? But it's, you know, when I was thinking about leaving UBC, right, I had to, there's sometimes like what I, what I said to myself at that time was there's something that's the best thing. And that's when like, if you were to just look at it, objectively and you were to write it down pros and cons you'd be like this is the best thing for you to do right so we have a lot of these things that are like the best thing on paper right but then we have the right thing right and this right thing is like not many people can see if people look at a, at it objectively they'd be like no that's not something you should do right but then we got to take that like internal account internal pros and cons to really go through that right but it's so hard to choose the right thing over that, that best thing. Yeah. Cause like, why would you do that? Right. It's like, Oh, it, if I, if I leave, then I'm going to have to, you know, uh, pick up the income that my partner had, or, you know, I'm going to have to, like, what am I going to tell these people? I'm going to have to tell everyone the story. Everyone's going to ask me. A lot of people don't even want to go through that. Right. And I feel like on a, deeper level is just people we don't value ourselves enough to be like i don't care what i have to do i'm gonna do whatever it is to make sure that i'm happy with myself at night yeah you know i don't think people really um care or think about that enough you know to be like it doesn't matter what everyone what do i feel because I'm the most important. Let me make this decision for myself. You know? I think one of the most valuable things I've learned is that the opinion of other people makes zero difference on the way that your life goes. You're mm -hmm. in control, right? Yeah. And so I think just from my own personal experience is that back in the day, I was concerned about letting people down. I was, I was concerned about friends thinking that I was a failure. I, mm -hmm. you know, had, I had a pretty good basketball career up until then. Yeah. And I just wasn't into it, mm -hmm. but were people going to be annoyed at me that I left Were was a coach going to be upset that I left mm -hmm. when I left North Dakota, the coach called my dad and was like, he was like basically yelling at my dad. He's like, how could he, how could uh, he make this decision? Like he's, he's ruining our program. We gave him all this money for yeah. four years and he leaves after one year. But like, what is best for him necessarily isn't best for me. Yeah. Right? 
what's best for a job, a boss is not necessarily best for you. And I think Mm -hmm. that's one of the best things that I've learned Mm -hmm. is that other people's opinions don't, shouldn't affect you and don't affect me anymore. Don't just got to do for yourself. Got to be selfish. Like really. But okay. But that is a negative word. Right? You know? The term selfish is always talked down yes, upon, right? Yes. But I completely agree that it's yeah. so important that you mm-hmm. have to think about yourself. Mm-hmm. If you're not mentally happy, if you're not mentally there, mm-hmm. you're just making it worse for everyone else. Yeah. That's involved in that. And selfish is really only a negative thing if you're a negative person. Yeah. Because you're going to do negative things to please yourself. But when I look at myself as selfish, I end up doing a lot for others. Because I actually enjoy that. I actually like it. That's what I love to do. Right? So it's like, that's when I did that exploration of like, what if I was 100% selfish? What would I do? And then you're like, hey, I I actually like that. You know, let me do, let me be more selfish. That's honestly, it's huge. Carl, are you selfish? Extremely selfish. (laughs) (laughs) No. (laughs) Carl is by far the reason that this podcast exists because I don't understand what he does over there. <laughs> I don't even know what this equipment is. <laughs> I call to Carl and I'm like, Hey, I want to start a podcast. Can you help me? He's like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> and all of a sudden, all this stuff was just here. That's amazing. And here we are. And I show up and I talk to people like you and somehow a few days later, it's just up on the <laughs> internet. I don't know what happens in between. Something happens, I'm you sure, know? but it's magic. The blessing, the connection, because we're, <laughs> we're really all connected. You know, at the end of the day, this is the, the triangle. Like, all three of us are connected, you know? So, for me, to, to come in, when I saw that you guys were doing this together, I was like, that's amazing. Because just to see friendships last over time, and when you're doing something like this, where it's like more of like a fun thing. Totally. Like, more of a pleasurable thing. Like, I'm going to do this with someone that I have fun with. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like I have to do this. I'm going to find the best person or whatever. It's like, I'm going to find someone I actually enjoy and love doing this with, right? So to see that you guys, like, after all this time are here and still together and still connected, (laughs) it's like, it's such a beautiful thing. You know what I mean? Like, it really is. It really is. It's interesting, though, because, like, we didn't hang out that much for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. A few times a year, maybe. But it's obviously brought our friendship back together, which Mm -hmm. is really cool. I almost feel like Carl's really into the podcast too, so he kind of motivates me. Mm-hmm. But I feel <laughs> sometimes <laughs> I feel like I'm pressuring him. Yeah. Because I just want, like, again, another goal that I can control. I want to do 100 podcasts this year. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm like, Carl, just so you know, I'm like kind of whispering, I really want to do 100 podcasts. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, pressure creates diamonds, man. Bring it on. Mm, See? Mm, He's so it. into it, too. It's amazing. <laughs> this keeps yeah. motivating me. <laughs> you know, it's such a beautiful thing. It's so beautiful. And, you know, even how you guys separate, not really separated, but not like you guys were always working so closely together mm-hmm. for the past 10 years. And it just shows, like, you know, we could let, we can go and do our own thing for a bit and not feel like you're leaving someone behind or feel bad or feel, you know, hurt. Like You could just, you know, so, like sometimes past go a little bit separate <laughs> we're enjoying our own things and yeah. we can come together like who knows what what happens you know what i mean we were pretty good friends in high school but i feel like our relationship is better today than it was in high school i think so i blame basketball i was <laughs> and imagine him aggressive. i can't imagine playing on his team hey you was know t- was, there were some he's, tough he's moments there in I know. practice looking at you like i put up more <laughs> shots than you <laughs> 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 He's but I did. But on the <laughs> other side, it makes you better too, right? Yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> was I difficult to play with? Were you difficult to play with? Yeah. No, but you were, um, you were very competitive. Intense, right? Yeah. Intense, you know? And I, just from like, for me in my state back then, is like you couldn't really be a friend to me unless you were really into that level of basketball to that same level. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like now I could really like just let go and like let's enjoy each other. But back then there was always this thing in my head of like like you know like basketball, basketball, you know what I mean? Like I gotta get better, you know? Like so I feel like now we have a little more potential 
to there connect. There was almost like a pressure as a kid to like be involved in the basketball community outside of basketball too. Yeah. So people would always talk about like, oh well, yeah, I'm friends with this guy that plays over here. Mm-hmm. I'm like I've never heard of that guy. Like, I, don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't really care. Yeah. All I know is I'm putting up more shots of him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I remember the North Shore was really cliquey like that. The North Shore? So cliquey, yeah. Oh, no, yeah. Like Argyle, Hansworth, and all those schools. Yeah, never, so cliquey. Never, never, never. Let me, um, let me ask a few questions. <laughs> yeah, let's hear it. There's a Come few. In. There's one, one moment that I remember. I, I forget. which. I think there's a few we played. Once we played at, when did we play each other? STM versus Palmer. One it was, was Lower Mainlands. Lower Mainlands. Yeah, it was like second round. Grade 12? Yeah. For us, grade 11. Yeah. 12, yeah. Grade 11. And we yeah. lost. You guys lost. And I really wanted that game tape. <laughs> that was Eves, right? Yeah. yeah. You guys have that game tape. <laughs> that was and, at Kitsilano, right? Yeah. Oh, you know what? No, we didn't play. We played at your guys' tournament. We played you at our No, tournament? we didn't play you guys, but we played at your tournament. And that was... That was something I remember. Okay, yeah, I remember you guys ran on the court one time. What? <laughs> I remember I had... Wait, I, you were playing? Yeah, when I was playing because I dunked on someone. Like, <laughs> like, a rebound and I just... Yeah, that sounds like something like, I would have done. On the court. I was like, oh, but yeah, I remember. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we played you guys that one time. I was so happy. Because <laughs> then he was... Like, you, you were the older guy. You know, you were like... Oh, like, I remember that year. I'm pretty sure you're, like, top 25 in the country list. All these things. So my competitive nature, I was like, oh, I got to be on these lists. Like, I got to. You know what I mean? Yeah. Do you remember what happened the next game? Who was that against? Uh, Kit. Are you sure? Yeah. I remember, because they had that guy. What was that guy's name? Krellen, right? Yeah. yeah. Was, that's his last name. What Clayton. was his first name? Clayton. Clayton. Yeah, yeah, Clayton. He's good. Kits was good that year. They lost in the finals, I'm pretty sure, to Dover Bay, right, in that year? Yeah. Uh, the championships? Yeah, maybe you're right. They, we were, this is just tooting my own horn, but I haven't had a good basketball moment in 15 years, so I'm going <laughs> to throw it out there. We were, we were down by, oh man, probably like 25 at halftime. Like, yeah. it was a bad first half. It was after losing to you guys, it was, yeah. we were pretty down. Uh, I think I had four points in the first half. I did not play well. Mm-hmm. I think I had a technical because I was really frustrated. <laughs> yeah, you were pissed. In the second half, I was just like, fuck it. Mm-hmm. I'm putting up shots. That was my mindset going in. I had 31 in the second half. Crazy. Do you remember? You probably don't remember. I just remember I was just being stupid. Yeah. And I would take like a dribble across center and put it up and I hit like <laughs> six or seven in a row. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I think we got the game back to, like, four or five, but we ended up losing. But it was, it, it was close. I just remember. The moment. Remember those feelings? It's so hard to describe. I was trying to describe it to someone watching the NCAA over the weekend. I think it was Alex. And I'm just like, there's just moments where you are in this zone. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to describe it, but you just, you can't miss. You're, like, surprised when it hits the rim. You're like, what? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That was yeah, Do you remember I ne- those moments? I rarely got those. Oh, come on. <laughs> you were good enough to get those. I, I guess I didn't get them in shooting, but I'd be like, right. how did I find that lane? Yeah, how yeah. did I like cut in between? Like central like, going then, in like, slow motion. Yeah, yeah. That was big. I actually, when I was at UBC, I had a moment because I didn't play at all in the playoffs, right? And we're in Canada West finals. And... We were down. I'm the fire, like the fire extinguisher. Like that's the only time I played. It was like, oh, we're in big trouble. Let's put him in to stir some stuff up, right? And that was, that was like the really the only time in my whole career where I actually like blacked out, <laughs> where I was like yelling on the court, like, <laughs> and like I really didn't see anything, and I was like. But it was nothing. I didn't score anything. I was just like so intense. And like I still made a couple of good defensive plays. That's so weird. <laughs> but I was like blacked out. Like, <sighs> like that. Did you watch any of the games this weekend? A little bit. Yeah. Here and there. What team was that guy in? Uh, it was a little Purdue. point guard for Purdue. What was his name? Score? Anyway, yeah. In the second half, he just went off. Mm-hmm. And he was doing the same thing. He was like one, two dribbles across center. And I think he had 
he had 42 in the game, but I think he had over 30 in the second half. And it was just so much fun to watch. Mm -hmm. And every single time I'm just like laughing at his shot selections, right? He's coming off a screen. He's like eight feet behind the three point line and just throwing it up. But he's a hundred percent confident that it's going in. And that's the biggest thing. Yeah. Yeah. Back to confidence. But those guys are so much fun to watch. Like Steph Curry gets like that often, right? Yeah. One of the best shooters in the world. (laughs) But some of the shots he takes are ridiculous. Crazy. you're just like, oh, he's hit six Like anyone in a else row. takes that shot, you're getting pulled. <laughs> yeah. With Dell, we got pulled a lot for, t- for taking good shots. <laughs> okay, let's move so away from wild. basketball. We can talk about basketball. That was we fun. <laughs> reminisce about basketball. Um, I just want to hear quickly about your YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. And you, you were mentioning you started it just over a year ago. It was actually over two years ago. Two years ago? Yeah. What, first of all, like, how has it grown so big? You have 22,000 subscribers now. Yeah. You have a couple of videos that are over 200,000 views. I don't think. I was, I, almost, was, almost. I was scrolling through your page. I thought there it was may, one at like 198. It may be, yeah. It may and be. one really close. Yeah, there's maybe some around up 200. There. There's some up there, yeah. But then there's a, more, a bunch more with like 80, 70, 80,000 mm-hmm. views. Mm-hmm. Where's the popularity come from? First of all, let's, let's talk about this. What, what's the message you're putting out with the YouTube channel? Yeah. So for me, with the YouTube channel... What it is, is like when I started to care about health and wellness, I didn't find anyone I could relate to. Mm. Very few people I could relate to. It was really dry, really boring content, really boring ways of sharing information. So what I wanted to do was to share what I was going through and be me. So that's basically my message, just sharing what I'm going through while being me. And it ends up being health, wellness, like food, movement, and mindset. And it's really just allowing to have a fun little flair to it, right? So a lot of my videos, I put a little skit in there, even if it's something quick. I just have a little bit of fun. You know, I I just aim to have more fun because that's who I am. And I recognize that I have an ability to make an impact because there's not many people who are like, take health serious but don't take themselves that serious you know what i mean so i um yeah i went in there and i feel like that's kind of how it resonated you know because you don't look at me and think you're gonna hear the things that you hear (laughs) i'm well aware of that you know what i mean especially if you ever knew me (laughs) you know what i mean so when people see the video and they're like oh, like he's bigger, he has muscles, but he's talking about veganism, plant-based eating. He's talking about like loving yourself. He's talking about meditation. They're like, hmm, let me, let me see more. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So like, I understand that there's that little appearance thing that can draw people in and like, you know, something that people can resonate with. So I feel that had a, a big part to play in it, in that, in the growth of the channel. And just like, I just was myself, like really, like I, I didn't think of like, how can I grow? I didn't think about, um, how to get people to watch me. I didn't think about any of that. All I thought about, I really only started my YouTube channel as a way to gain confidence with myself. Yeah. Because at that time I had an issue, I had a problem expressing and communicating. So I wanted to, I had, I was like, I felt like I have to do it. I felt like I got to be on YouTube, but then I had this issue communicating. So I would like, honestly, I have videos, vlogs before I posted anything. I have so many videos that I didn't (laughs) post, you know, because I was so scared to. And even I started my YouTube channel off of like, just, just post it. Who cares? Just post it. You know, my friend came over. I had food all over the table. I'm like, hey, before we eat, because we're going to cook together. I was like, before we eat, just film me for five, 10 minutes. And then I just like, just talk. You know what I mean? And that video is one of the videos with almost 200,000 views. And it was really just like, okay, just do, just do it, just do it, just do it, just do it. And I feel that has a thing too, because I never really had a motive or I never was trying to sell people anything or, you know get this growth i just i just wanted to be able to say like i put out videos like (laughs) yes (laughs) it was so satisfying man (laughs) 
do you still have the old videos that you never posted? They're there, yeah. Like, <laughs> you, ever, you ever thought about just like going back in time, finding the very first one that was so bad, probably mm -hmm. or super awkward, and posting it on like a Throwback Thursday or something? I did post one on Instagram. Yeah, it's so funny because you hear in my voice, and the thing is, like, I was so aware of like the state I was in. So yeah. I was like, I was in the library recording in their little studio they have, and I was like doing my intro, and then I was like. What's up, y'all? I'm just here in the Vancouver Public Library practicing, you know, like you hear the shake in my voice, <laughs> yeah. like working on finding ways to get better at producing content for you. Yeah. And, um, you know, and then I just kind of laughed and stopped, <laughs> you know, but that was the video. So um, I have like so many of those ones and I did actually post one. I was like, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. Is it cool to look back at those and see how much growth you've made? How much better you've got. Oh, I love it. How much more comfortable you get. Yeah. yeah. I love it. And I, I forget. It's so easy to forget. You know, I, at, last year at this time, like when I say like I actually started my YouTube channel because I actually started to take it serious. Like let's post in a consistent schedule. Yeah. Right. I did that last year and I saw a lot of growth and then I stopped. But then I started doing that again this year. Right. But I had so, excuse me, I had so much resistance posting videos because i'm like oh this video isn't good enough this video isn't that but then i look back on my old ones i'm like yo you used to post these who are you come off of it you know what i mean like come off like you could just humble yourself you know what i mean and get to the essence of the message you know so yeah that's what i think about with the podcast for me is um i didn't know what i was doing at the beginning mm -hmm. i still don't <laughs> really know what I'm doing. <laughs> I just, I feel like I've gained so much confidence and become so much more comfortable. And it's cool to look back in five or six months that we've been doing it and see how much better I am. Yeah. And then I flip it around and I'm use it as motivation. If I can get this good in five months, mm -hmm. how good am, are we going to be in a year from now, in right? two years from now? Right. And it's exciting and motivating exciting. to be like, oh, I'm actually capable of doing these things. Yeah. So as you look back, you're like, oh, wow, that was me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's even in just the in the last couple of weeks, I've felt that the quality of the podcast have gotten so much better. Like it, it, it comes down to the guest a lot, mm -hmm. but I like listening to Joe Rogan and like people who do it really well, yeah. who um, like steer the conversation yeah. in the right ways to get the most out of the guest too, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. adds so much value. Yeah. And it's cool to just like feel how much better we're getting. Yeah. And one thing Carl said to me, I don't know, a month ago, month and a half ago, whatever, is he's like, Joe Rogan is a, such a great listener. Mm -hmm. He like is able to understand what someone's trying to say and then dig a little bit deeper on this really interesting topic. Mm -hmm. And so like, that's what I'm thinking now when I'm listening to these other people's podcasts. Yeah is yes, I'm listening to the experience and the message that people are trying to say, mm -hmm. but I'm listening to the host yeah. and like how they're steering the conversation in the right ways to get the most out of the guest. And that's yeah. really cool. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm getting better. There's obviously so much room for improvement because we're still pretty new, but I can see the progress and that's super exciting to me. Yeah, it's amazing. You've done, how many have you done this year? If you're on that hundred goal, you've done uh, a decent amount. 30, 25? Yeah, somewhere around there. 25 between 25 30. and 30. Right. So you're, that's a lot of practice. Totally. You know, it's amazing. Um, Cause even with the videos, I would like, I would challenge myself to make a video every day at one point. And that's when I saw like amazing improvement. Right. And then, you know, for us to be able to create as much as possible. And like you're saying, like just learning from doing, right? totally. you learn from doing. So let's just do more and <laughs> simplify it. Just do it. You know? It's cool to, well, I'm sure you felt this too with how, how much exposure you're getting now with over 20,000 subscribers, but it's cool to start, even when you put stuff out that you think is really bad, and I know you thought this because of how competitive you are, to get a lot of positive feedback on it. Ugh. You right? know what the worst thing for me is? What? When I put hours into a video, <laughs> like when I spend the last two weeks, like four or five hours a day, editing a video and it's like 
oh, I'm just so proud of it. And it's no reach, like doesn't go anywhere. I'm just like, come on, (laughs) y'all. But um, yeah, but then there's the ones where I'm like, just holding the camera up like, no, 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 no. Like, and then that one, like everyone loves it, you know? Um, so it's, it's so, it's so interesting. And going back to like, just not thinking about the outcome and like, just like what you can control and not really focusing or worrying about, you know, what, how it's received or how well, or, you know what I mean? Cause there's no real formula, right? How to make videos. So things just catch on randomly. Like how many things, like random things just catch on and just go viral, right? Yeah. You just got to put it out there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is there a moment or <clears throat> do you get lots of comments on your videos? A decent amount, yeah. Do you look at them all? Yeah, I do. Do you comment? Oh, God. <laughs> a lot of them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's so fun. Was there like a specific comment or like a specific moment where you thought, okay, maybe I'm onto something, maybe I'm providing value for people to, in order to start taking it more seriously, in order to like set schedules for yourself and say, I want to do this many per week or whatever? Um, like I guess when did you know that it was providing value for people? After my second video. That early, eh? Hey? Yeah, That's cool. after my second video, but it it's not like it really took off right away. It was like maybe like two, three months later. My friend is like, my friend called me. He's like, yo, your videos have five hundred views. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like watching my videos, like watching that same video. He's like, You're getting about like fifty views a day. You're gonna be at a thousand soon. You know what I mean? <laughs> So like we were in that time and when I got a thousand and then just to just to see the the comments in there and just to see how um, like people are are searching. Why I really like YouTube is because I find I look at YouTube as YouTube is for the seekers, right? You don't go to YouTube. Rarely do people go to YouTube just to scroll. Hmm. People go to YouTube of like, how do I eat better? How do I do this? What does this, you know what I mean? That's what people go to YouTube for. So what I found out more than anything was like, hey, there's people here who are looking for things. And whoa, you provided them with something, an answer to their question or, you know, a way to guide them or a way to think about something differently. So, you know, it was when in those times in the early part of the videos, which I really am so grateful for those times because more than anything, it, it like told me to trust that initial instinct that got you to start. So I'm like, thank you universe for making people watch my videos and comment because it made me have that confirmation out there to be like, keep going. Like, why did you stop? You know what I mean? Like, why did you stop? You know, so that was, that was a big thing. It allowed me to but hey, keep going. And I, I took me a year and a half after, like, yeah, probably a year and a half, a year after that to even think about making it scheduled. Mm. You know, I'm the worst YouTuber ever. Like, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> last year when I was at my highest growth, I stopped. Crazy. Consciously? Um, like, I don't or know. you just like I just, burnt I, out of it or what? I don't know. It just fizzled away you know so now i'm moving into this with consciousness and like yo don't let that happen (laughs) so now i'm going through that phase where i'm like oh i'm getting a lot of growth right now but i'm like don't let that stop you like keep going stay consistent you know stick to the schedule stick to the routine you know so do you get any negative comments so many so so many dude this is the youtube comment section we're talking about holy <laughs> of course. wow yeah wow and i just like i usually only reply to people who are genuinely like i feel who are genuinely like mad and they want to learn better like they actually are interested in learning some people are just commenting i'm like i'm not even gonna respond to you like you're just trolling you're just like have no clue you come back in like a maybe couple years <laughs> months i may you know what i mean but um i try to respond to everyone even those negative ones because even in those it's like you know they're they're coming from their level of understanding and then if i don't have to get caught up in the energy of it but i could provide my understanding a little bit more maybe it helps clarify it for them but um yeah i do my best to not 
get caught up in either the positive or the negative comments and to just be like, yeah, I'm getting comments. <laughs> People are responding, you know, and just to take it all kind of like in the center. It's cool. To, yeah, it's got to be cool to see people are taking time out of their day to, first of all, watch a oh, 20, 30, 40 hour wow. long video. Wow. But then also comment on it. Wow. Right. So you got to be grateful just for oh. the audience and that people are caring. You know, now that you say that, I feel that I stopped because I don't believe it. Like I didn't believe it. Like people are watching, people are commenting. This is a real thing. People are impacted by it. Like I feel that's the what I had as a belief or else I would have kept going. But I didn't really believe in it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, it's crazy because now I have like a decent backlog of videos for people to watch. So I could see like, okay, this person commented at 6 p.m. Oh, they commented again at 7 p.m. on this video. Oh, they commented at 8. Oh, they commented at 9. <laughs> so they're watching and four I'm or like, five videos in a row. <laughs> they're watching six hours straight. Yeah. You know what I mean? Within six hours, they're tuned into the content. I'm just like, for one, that's amazing for, for just whatever you do, do it well, because people can come back and find it and watch it and they can get value from that, right? So that's always going to be there and people will, can watch it 10 years from now, right? So that's something there. But just to think about, wow, like when I look at the numbers, I'm like, what like honestly it's so weird it's so weird man but like yeah and i actually met people in real life from my youtube right like will they come up to you how do you meet them um they well not much in vancouver canada right most of my people are in the u.s interesting yeah okay. right but what ha i i hosted a retreat last year right and they were people from my youtube <laughs> That came on the retreat. <laughs> that came on the retreat, right? So then that was like another thing of like, oh, and I'm sitting here with these people and we're connecting and like, we're still talking like six, eight months later. These are real connections that we've made. And just to meet them and to be like, yo, like the world is so small. Like we can really connect all over the world. And like my people are everywhere. You know what I mean? It just made me like really feel solid in that of like, Everywhere in the world, there's people. So uh, one thing is like, all you need is 1% of people to be on your side, to like you. 99% gone, right? And when you look at the numbers, oh, 1% of even Vancouver, what's 1% of like, whatever, 1 million Vancouver people, right? That's a lot of people. Imagine you had only 1%. So like, if we're just looking, hey, all I want is 1%. All I care about is 1%, right? That's a whole lot of people. 1% here, 1% there. I was like, you know what I mean? So yeah, it's, it's surreal. Still to this day, like, I can't believe it. And yeah, <laughs> it's weird, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, obviously you had a pretty outgoing personality as a kid mm -hmm. in high school. So I'm not shocked to see like the love and enthusiasm and optimism um, meaning something to people. And so, like, I don't know if my opinion matters at all, regardless of whether it does or not. No I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it anyway. Life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm learning from you, Danny. <laughs> no, I just want to say, like, keep it up, man. Bless, man. Appreciate. I think you're doing a good Appreciate thing. Love. And Appreciate. I think by the numbers, number of people that you're seeing, I think it's pretty easy to see that, like, it means a lot to people. Mm -hmm. The optimism, the smiles, the encouragement, the I think it's just like so genuine when you talk about yourself and your spirituality and what fitness has done for you and all that kind of stuff. It's just, it's so easy to see how genuine it is. Mm -hmm. So I just say, keep it rolling, man. Much love, my man. Yeah. Much love, much bless. Thanks so much for coming on the show, man. That was Thank a lot you. of fun. It was great Thanks to catch up. Thanks for having up. me. You too. A pleasure, a blessing. I like just on that last thing you're saying, why I was like, yo, I got to get on one is like, we have our history, yeah. but just one of like seeing you guys on the podcast, hearing you guys on the podcast, it was like, these guys, these guys love it. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're yeah. loving what they're doing. So I'm like, yeah, I definitely got to, you know, I got to come on. I got to reach out and you know what I mean? See, see how we can connect. So, you know, same goes for you two of like, keep going, you know, keep that, that spark, 
you know, keep that spark alive and just keep moving. And, you know, who knows what happens from these things, right? Totally. Mm -hmm. It's uh, like going in, we talk about expectations and like, of course you set weird goals that I don't Mm -hmm. know where these random things come from, but it's Mm -hmm. just like, okay, this is the goal. But really it's just like produce things that you believe in. Mm Mm-hmm. Talk to people that I like am genuinely curious about because mm-hmm. the conversations are so much better when I like really care about something like yeah. fitness. I care a lot about food and like what you put in your body too. Mm-hmm. I just don't, I'm not educated on it. So yeah. I like asking questions to people who have yeah. done more research than me, mm-hmm. but just put out stuff that you believe in. Yeah. And if people watch it, great. If not, who cares? But exactly. it's educating me. Mm-hmm. It's helping me network. If it provides any value to people, great. Yeah, a blessing, man. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm giving thanks. It's an honor. Much love. Yeah, just grateful. Throw out your YouTube channel, just if uh, people want to check it out. My YouTube channel, just my name, Akeem Pierre. So you can check that out. And yeah, that's the vibe. Akeem's doing big things. I love it. <laughs> man, thanks so much for coming on. Much I appreciate love, it a lot. Much great love, to catch up. Love. We'll have to stay connected for sure. Yes, sir. Much blessed. Thank y'all for having me. Everyone listening. Y'all listening to the Blessed Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for listening, guys. Hit me up on Instagram. I would love to hear your feedback. Positive, negative. If you want to hit up Chemo too, hit up his uh only put positive comments in his YouTube though. <laughs> None of this shit with negative. None of that. This guy is so <laughs> genuine and excited about life. How can you be negative back to him? I don't get it. Anyway. Good night, guys. <laughs> <laughs>